so thank you ever so much both to Board Beer and also to all of you for coming tonight. Uh, I'm not under any illusion, you probably come here to hear Jim speak, not me, but hopefully by the end of the evening I'll have at least given you some information to help you to think slightly differently and maybe act slightly differently. Um, as we already said, my name's Sarah Lenorgan. I actually, I started with Walkers on the graduate training programme and I've spent my life all over the place. I've lived in Kenya, I've lived in Africa and other places and I've lived in the States. But right now, I've just come from the last, well, 12 years working for Coke and been with UB for the last year. And it's important to talk about this because I've had the privilege of working for many, many, many very big organisations and I've learned an awful lot. But to leave a company like Coke and to go to a company like United Biscuits, which is a, a very good company in its own right, but probably more mid-size, you have to ask yourself the question, why? And I joined them because Martin Glenn, actually, and a prior boss, was leading them at the time. But actually, as an organisation, there is so much potential within it. Um, and I feel quite privileged today to talk to you about some of the work the team's been doing. It's quite relevant because, as I say, they're not the biggest company. They don't have the biggest marketing spends. But I think we've been quite clever with what we do. And I think it's great for people that don't necessarily sit there with millions and millions and millions of pounds to see the little things that you can do to build your brand and also to get more preference with the trade. So that's what we're going to go and talk a little bit about today. So first thing is, let's, let's just set some context. There are a number of people here who work in biscuits. But, and for those of you that know biscuits, then actually you don't need to know this. But for those of you that don't, part of my job whenever I come out to speak is to reinforce people's belief in biscuits, particularly if there are retailers in the room, because we do want them to focus on the category. And actually, it's a massive, massive category biscuits. You may not be aware. Big size, two and a, nearly just over two and a half billion pounds in terms of uh, size. Actually, every household eats about 80 packets of biscuits a year. Um, believe it or not, it's actually eaten in 10% of every food occasion. And that is true. It's one of the few categories that from the day you start your life, from cradle to grave, you keep eating. You know, and I think that's critical because you, you start with a rusk, you start with a breadstick. When you get to the more sedate sort of 80s, 90s, it's one of the few things you can continue to eat quite happily. But actually throughout the whole of the cohort, it stays very, very consistent. The key is which types of biscuits they're eating, but very, very big in that way. More penetration than toilet paper in the UK, um, which again is another fascinating <laughs> fact, um, I guess, for, a number, for the 2% of households that are probably eating biscuits but not using toilet paper. So uh, an incredibly big and important category in terms of a, a focus. And McVitie's in the UK, not in Ireland, um, you know, but McVitie's in the UK is the number one brand. So a very, very big brand and many, many people know it. The challenge is, for many years, and those of you that don't know the McVitie's history in recent times, they've been venture capitalist owned. We'd had a couple of years of cutting back costs, making sure we milked everything. And what had happened was McVitie's was quite happy, big brand, doing quite well, people trusted it. It was nostalgic, it had a lot of heritage, it was very reliable in people's lives. But at the same time, it was becoming old-fashioned, unremarkable, it lacked new news. And if you think about the biscuit category and you think about the innovation that's come into confectionery, you understand why. I know we've got James here from Mondelez who works on chocolate confectionery. And you know, you look at it and you think they've done a great job at Mondelez blurring the categories between confectionery and biscuits. Many other manufacturers have done as well, but a lot of new news come into the category, not just from Mondelez, but also from Bath and other European companies as well. At the same time, we faced exactly the same challenge, but the other side, which was the discounter end or the value end. So, you know, mass, you know it has, I don't know if you know, but biscuits massively overtrade in discounters. If you think about a discounter store, the first thing you see when you come through the door is a shitload of biscuits, really, cheap biscuits. And actually, it drives so much penetration, but it also sets a precedent in terms of size. So, on with that challenge, we had the same thing with the retailers wanting to push sales of cheaper biscuits and basically drive the biscuit category through the bottom rather than the top which is a challenge to all the manufacturers in the, in the, in the category, I suppose. Uh, and we were very, very concerned. We were on this massive race to the bottom rather than keeping ourselves with value add and creating margin, etc. So it's critical for us as the market leader to make sure that we thought about this, reflected on it, and actually rethought how do we use our brand for better effect. The challenge we had was what a driven our success as a market leader, i.e. a disparate selection of multitude of brands, and there were 24 good-sized brands in the McVitie's portfolio, was actually, at this point in time, our biggest failing. Because what we were doing was we were fragmenting our offer. We were, we were fragmenting the, how we brought our products to market in terms of promotional ends, 
You know, we were fragmenting because we were spending our money across too many brands with limited halo effect. And actually, we were fragmenting our offer because actually there's so many products on the shelves. We really didn't have a strong piece and a strong, a strong way forward. So it was really, really important to us that actually we rethought about how do we make sure we get more from more. It's not about selling 24 individual brands, like challenger brands they were. We weren't maximizing our scale. Each one of those in their own right was being driven forward. But actually, we needed to pull it together under one uniform master brand strategy. And in simple terms, this is exactly what we did. We had, a, as you can see on the chart there, a whole load of different brands, home of brands, everything, every brand was autonomous, all had a load of money, all did their own thing, but actually we weren't getting the scale. And in simple terms, we weren't being less successful. And I don't know how you see it in the Irish market at the moment, but in the last year or the last couple of years in marketplaces where I've been working in, we saw this move. We went from big brands having a big share to actually having a lot, a plethora of smaller brands. The ends, et cetera, were really fragmented. You'd have 20, 30 products on the same end. You know, even within the brands, to try and get the scale and to afford the massive rise in terms of retailer gondola end costs, we were putting on too many brands. And actually, what ended up happening is we weren't getting the returns. The trade weren't getting the returns because actually, you know what, it's very hard to turn a million pounds or a million euros on an end if you've got number one seller getting this much space and the numbers two to 50 getting this much space on the same end. It's equally true on the shelf. And I think we're all facing that now. Same thing as UB were thinking, but equally with the trade at a time of pressure when we're all chasing about a two point variable share, doesn't matter which category you're in, which retailer you are, you've got to make sure you focus on your core. And I think this was really, really critical for us within UB. Make sure we have one master brand, make sure that master brand, we get a halo effect for all the others. It doesn't matter if we don't promote everything as long as the whole message is consistent throughout. And that was one of the goals. So we decided to create this master brand strategy, four different things we wanted to do. First thing was we needed to rejuvenate the brand because as I said already, it was very old fashioned. The second thing was we knew that fame and emotion drives more long-term sales. And I'm going to come on to that again in a minute. But that was really, really critical for us as well. We had to build emotion back into biscuits, give people reasons to believe in the category and in our brands. We needed to improve the shopping experience. Biscuits are one of the most difficult categories to shop in the store. There are thousands of SKUs in most stores. Even within small convenience outlets, most of the range comes, most of the sales from the top 30 SKUs. There are upwards of 120, 150 SKUs in the stores. We did not need that much range. Had to simplify. And the last thing was we had to improve our promotional return on investment, particularly also within our advertising, because actually at the time we weren't hitting the norms with our advertising that others in the industry were. So that's where we went from and to. Now, I, I mean, I put this as a bit of a contentious comment, but for me, you know, I think we've, a lot of companies have got very, we talked about digital being important and it absolutely is. I'm going to say that actually, first of all, you know, we have got to be cognizant of the fact that the children of today are not growing up shopping the way we did as children. My household, we don't shop in a store at all. Fact. The only time we go into a store is when we do shoe shopping. So both my kids are growing up in an environment where all of our purchasing is online. So they don't ask me, when are we going shopping? They ask me, when's the shopping coming? Now, if you think of that when you're marketing and you're thinking about the money we're putting into our brands, and how we use our marketing elements of our marketing from packaging through to above the line, we've got to be cognizant of the fact that the way people are living their lives is changing. So I say digital is very important because in the digital world, you've got to make sure that you can actually do the same job that your packaging does in store, or you've got to find new ways to get to the people where they're living their lives. But apart from that, all marketing to me is the same. 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 20 years ago today, it's about getting the simple things right. It's about knowing who you want to target, making sure you target them with the right message, making sure it's the right time and making sure it's in the right way. And this was the critical part of our master brand strategy, trying to get to those outcomes. Now, I don't know how many of you, have you heard of, um, there's been a really big study. Has anybody heard of Binet and Field? Two different, uh, a researcher and a, 
um, and it's actually an, a consultant who worked for, in the olden days, DBB. Um, but these guys, through the, in, in, through the IPA, the, industry, the Promotional Advertising Effectiveness Agencies, actually went back and looked at different campaigns over the last 30 years. More than, I think, 80 brands, 996 different campaigns. And in this kind of seminal study in 2013, they actually uh, worked out what was the recipe of success for really good marketing campaigns, which I know we all would love to have. But one of the things that really stood out within that, and I, so I put this slide up here, is at the heart of really successful campaigns is about emotion. And this chart shows you basically in the black, you've got your, um, your emotional priming, in the red, you've got your rational messaging. If I come and market to you and I tell you my biscuit tastes better than his biscuit, today you might believe me and you might go and try it but tomorrow there'll be a better biscuit or a better hair colorant or a better softer skin cream, whatever it might be. The critical piece is how you get under the skin of the emotions. So how we get into the intrinsics of the product, how we get us to feel differently. Do you get to see the John Lewis campaign over in Ireland, right? Great campaign, Bear and Hair. You will remember the music from that advert for a long, long time. It gets into people's psyche. The things you remember are far more, emo the emotion stands for longer and keeps the brand going for longer. So critically for us was we knew if we wanted to make money, we had to get into a campaign that really tapped into people's emotions and was not about biscuits itself. And the critical thing with that was, it, you know, the difficult thing was, it, that's what people said to us the whole time. We did loads of research. A lot of people in this room are researchers, but trying to get out of people what was that emotional connection with biscuits was really really hard and they kept saying to us why are you asking us about biscuits in this way it's only a bloody biscuit that's all it is right so we had to find that deeper level of i guess understanding that feeling that we could milk we could bring out and bring together and that's really the key for this whole presentation which is we got to a really simple insight that we could then pull through in everything we did so in simple terms, there was a really difficult paradox we had to embrace. Um, biscuits, we know, they're everyday, they're inconsequential. At the same time, they're powerful, important, because they actually connect a lot of occasions and a lot of people together. Um, ethnography and semiotics, which many of you will use in your own businesses, showed us that it doesn't matter whether you're on the building site, doesn't matter whether you're in the boardroom, doesn't matter whether you're you know, after school club, sports club, etc. Biscuits, a very inconsequential product, was everywhere and helping people to make life just that little bit better. Not massively better, but just a little bit better. So basically, what we understood was that biscuits have this role to play in making everyday moments just that little bit better, which I know is not that different from many other categories that probably got very similar comments, but it was key to us as a, as a company. Then that gave us this ability for our insights team, our marketing teams, and also our innovation teams to think about how can we innovate in that way? How do we need to bring our comms to life so that we actually can really get behind this? You know, as a business, we had to move away from not what base biscuits do for you, but how biscuits can make you feel. And that was the critical piece. So for those of you who've seen the advert, and we're gonna see it a little bit later on, but really, you know, a lot of you will probably be sitting here now, yeah, I have seen the advert and it's got all these funny little animals in it. I don't really understand it. I don't think it's that good. And actually, I, I, I don't understand why she's sitting here telling me this is all such a success because it doesn't really work for me. But actually, the really weird thing is that the simple insight said, you have got to make sure this phenomenon of cute pain. So they've said to us already, biscuits kind of are very simple, they're trivial, but they're also powerful. So you start to think about how do you bring that to life, that triviality, that powerfulness. We wanted to make it fame worthy. We want to make it consistent and readily identifiable. Um, but we wanted to create that trivial but powerful feeling. So as we thought about the powerful, we wanted people to love it and instantly want to squeeze it. We wanted people when they saw the animals to tap into their human desire to make sure that the thing that brings them out around cute babies, cute puppies, the stuff we share on Facebook, all that stuff that's shareable where you see you know, goats bouncing on stuff or you see little dogs doing this or the other or whatever. So basically cute things we know release great feelings in people. Um, and that to us represented the same as the feeling people got when they were eating Mavitti's biscuits. And what we did was actually we looked at the biscuit and the brand architecture of each biscuit and tried to find an animal that represented that feeling in life. So we matched the animal in its cutest form to the biscuit, which is why if you see the McVitie's advertising, each biscuit has its own little set of characters. So what this led us to was a 
very simple, very, very simple, actually, New McVitie's world and campaign idea. Um, you know, packaging is important to everybody. Trying to create great visual cues is very, very important to everybody. For McVitie's itself, it's about the blue and the gold. Um, for Go Ahead in the UK market, it's the green. And for obviously for Jacobs in the UK market, it's very strongly for the orange. You know, we can learn from the best on this. Mondelez do a fantastic job. I'm going to say purple, but it's probably lilac or it probably has a special Mondelez colour name. But they do a great job with their colour coding. Doesn't matter when, as soon as you see that purple in their adverts, the guy's got the purple jumper on, you go in store, you see it on the product. In the back room, their products stand out like mad because they look great. You can find a Mondelez product anywhere because of the purple in it. We don't do the same, or we didn't do the same at Mavitis. We, we had a number of different colours, a number of different packaging designs. And what we did, we said, right, we're going to stick with just the gold and we're going to stick with the blue. Um, and that will become our brand colours forever. Nothing fancy, but actually taking ourselves to a place where all of our packaging was consistent and followed through into the store and into the stockroom. Even that was quite a challenge for us. Um, we also, as, I, as you can see here, brought in the animals. So this is where they were supposed to be trivial but powerful and um, just like the biscuits were really. So that's the kind of the marketing side of it. And my big bag is really more the customer marketing side of it. But um, for me, shoppers, and, and for all of us, I'm sure, shoppers have to be at the heart of our activation. We had to make sure that we didn't let the advertising medium, what we'd done on the TV, kill the creativity at store. We worked really, really hard with our retailers to bring a campaign to life that was tailored, that was differentiated by a retailer. Um, we have, within UB, our own retailer panels. I'm sure many of you have got consumer panels. One of the things we've set up in the last year for most of our channels now are retailer panels. And I would really encourage you, it's a, it doesn't cost much, but actually, because in fact, you don't have to pay any agencies. What you do is you work with the people you work with every day to set up panels to help you to do a better job and help them do a better job. So we have our own UB Ambassadors Club where we have, just to take the independence or the wholesale example, where we have about 30 of the top independent retailers uh, who have a change of stores from one to 50. And we have about 30 of just very much sole traders who will help us on a daily basis, giving us advice about what we need to do and how we need to do things differently. And it's been so fantastic for our whole trade strategy to have that. Because they've taught us things that we just didn't know or wouldn't have done in the past. They've taught us the importance of not talking about McVitie's and about digestives, because actually everyone knows you want to stock a McVitie's and a digestive. It's about why would you stock the other five products you want to stock in convenience or in wholesale, etc. They've taught us about you know, what we need to do to bring our products to market in the way that matters to them. Where, what information do they need from us? We've got a new product. Is it all about free giveaways, pens, bunting, etc.? Or is it more about what you can do for the community for events to drive traffic to their store? And I would say for us, we did an awful lot of that work and we continue to do that all the time long. And it's probably the most useful initiative we brought into our business because every day we have WhatsApp groups in all our channels and they're constantly feeding and selling the new ideas to each other. So really, really good insight on that one. The other thing we wanted to have was one seamless communication online and offline. So we didn't allow ourselves to go down another route of commoditization with biscuits, which is what most of the category was doing. We actually tried to make sure that we brought the characters to life, um, both through shopper marketing plans and also making things playful. So we had things like goggly eyes, tasiers at the fixture. Um, we had uh, aisle arches, as you can see in the imageries there. I think you can see them. You know, we worked with some of our trade partners even to bring the advertising onto their trucks for extra revenue. And we branded up our real estate. But at the same time, it wasn't just about the in-store. It was also about our website. So we used our websites to offer cute experiences to people. And it's amazing. We got some sort of immersion work doing, but you would be surprised how many people on the theme of animals and pets can innovate around the types of promotions, the type of activities they want to have. I think if we had done bring your favourite pet to store, we'd have probably sold a lot more biscuits and probably driven a lot more traffic for the tray because that's what people were wanting. But, you know, it was just different stuff that we did. And I... It also was about different advertising. And I said to you before, you know, the advertising we've run is very consistent. Uh, it typically features the occasion where we want the product to be eaten. It typically features the type of family or individuals that would be eating the biscuit. Uh, and we try and make it fairly catchy with the music's remains over time. I'm just going to run the Christmas ad for those of you that haven't seen it, and then we'll come and talk about it after that. So if that's OK with you, could you run the video, please? Biscuits. 
McVitie's Victoria Biscuit Selection. The milk, white and dark chocolatey cheer of McVitie's. Sweet. Right, now, I'm sure a lot of you in the room are thinking that is either very good or that is really bad. And I think everybody in UB felt the same thing, which was, you know, that's the Christmas advert, but do you kind of the further biscuit eating, showing how the packaging has got this easy reseal opening, etc. Is it too much? Is it, how does it work, etc. And, and to be honest, we were polarised, like many of you will be when you do your campaigns. We just did not know. So we had to turn to neuroscience, really, because we couldn't ask people what they felt about it. We had to go into neuroscience to really get underneath whether the, did the emotional reaction, was it the right one to have? And actually what it showed was that people really love the ads. It kind of showed that the ads entertain them, but more importantly than all, it, believe it or not, it had very low wear out and it got them to think about McVitie's. It completely reinforced it was a McVitie's advert in a way we just hadn't sort of really understood. So um, we were really happy with that, unexpectedly happy, but particularly happy, um, excuse me, particularly happy with the amount of uh, publicity it generated. So whilst we were prompting through social media, etc., what was going on, we didn't have any clue that this would go so big in terms of the media. Um, and for though you may not have seen it, but actually it was voted the number one. It beat John Lewis last year in the advert. Again, you wouldn't think it would, but it did. Um, it managed to get onto all kinds of coverage. Time, it got on the front of Time magazine. It got to the Good Morning America, etc. Um, purely, again, because you have these people writing articles that love this whole feeling of little cuteness, puppies, etc, etc. Um, so, you know, a really, really huge PR success. And most importantly of all, we will all say, you know, we don't get paid on all that kind of stuff, but we get paid on our metrics. And as somebody that's worked for Coke for 12 years and who's tried to gain one percentage change in brand equity, um, the results have been phenomenal with this campaign. Um, net promoter score increased by 21%, which is phenomenal in the year. We've got the biggest share, which is good for us, um, category grew as well. Our rate of return on investment, we said at the start on our advertising, was massive. 34% up versus the prior year. The Nielsen norm is 63. We hit nearly 87 in terms of return on investment from our advertising. Um, our brand tracking statements increased. Every single one, with the exception of one, increased, and the one that didn't increase stayed the same. But we had more than a 10-point swing in terms of favorite brand and in terms of uh, brand for me. Um, as a brand itself, it went up to number three. And in terms of, in terms of awareness, etc., our awareness grew up from 80, I guess it was from 89 to 95% within a given year. So really, really strong metrics that the business can stand behind and know it's successful. Now, the critical thing as well is, it's not just, we've done the campaign, we've got some good results, but actually what I also wanted to talk to you about just briefly was how we got it to the trade. So, um, I don't know how you take your brand plans to the trade, but for us in the last year, it's been quite different. Um, we have, well, the last couple of years, we've taken the trade to us. We've managed to have, between June and so October, we had more than 30 retailers come to us. Um, all of the retailers, in fact, in the UK that we work with, with the exception of one. Um, we've had retailers come from Ireland to our venue as well, which shows not only were they prepared to make the investment to come to a meeting in their own venue, but also to come overseas. And what we did was we took over a building, took over a whole floor of a building, not at our office, but we actually managed to bring to life our plans with every single brand. Um, brought to life within the room itself. So we had a McVitie's room, as you can see. We had a Jacob's room. We had a go-ahead room. And we obviously had other rooms which related to channels, omni-channel, and also rooms related to the future growth of the category. I wanted to show you this room because actually you've seen the advertising. You've, I've talked to you about the fact we wanted to make sure that everything was consistent. But also being consistent is making sure we treat our retailers as consumers. Absolutely critical. I'm not sure we do enough of that. 
The guys that are buying our brands in the store are, and the people that are buying our brands before them get into the store, they should be treated in the same way. We needed to make sure that when the retailers were making their buying decisions, they knew the brand the same way as we were going to speak to the consumers about. So this is the example of the McVitie's room. You can see it's very consistent with the advertising. It is a room where they came, they had their whole presentation on the settee. They were served coffee and tea with their biscuits. Uh, they saw all the innovation. Each screen we presented, the brand team presented in those rooms. And actually it worked really, really well um, because they started to really feel the love for the brand. And interestingly enough, one of the things we did there was we decomposed the whole brand itself. So we took back, you know, many people have challenges at the moment with food, ingredients, safety, etc. We showed them, we had our chefs from the development kitchens, and I was saying earlier to, Jim, to John that actually, you know, we, we have two guys that work in our kitchens who are making biscuits every day, one, both of whom have worked in Michelin-starred restaurants. They sit in a development centre, locked away from everybody all day long, every day. And yet we have two guys that are sitting there with lead chef on their jackets and the big hat, and they would never, ever see the trade. The impact we had of bringing these two guys out of the kitchen to talk to the trade about how you make a biscuit. We had Sainsbury's say to us, actually, we, when we came into the meeting, into the, actually into the venue, we thought that uh, biscuits, we just thought them as another package good, because that's what they are to us. They're just another skew to sell. And actually, she said, we came away, we didn't even think, she said, it sounds silly, but we didn't actually realise you'd have real people making biscuits in a kitchen somewhere. Um, so it took them away from the meeting feeling completely different about biscuits and the role of biscuits than before. But equally, at the same time, they got to see all the ingredients that were going into the products. So, you know, a lot, you know we talk about clean label, we talk about how good, you know, we've got a lot of challenges in our industry at the moment, but actually when you actually see that some of the basic, the basic kinds of ingredients that we're putting into our products, it's quite, um, quite critical. So we did that in, the, in, the, in what would be the Cars room for the Irish market or the Jacobs room for the UK market. You know, it was all about, they, they, they had their brand presentation, eating crackers, eating cheese and drinking wine. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to feel that kind of rethinking their lunch moment, and that's what they did. So you know, it really, really helped us to kind of drive that forward and do things slightly differently. And as a result of it, actually, we got 100% of the retailers in the feedback said it was a good use of their time. And we've blocked our media down, I guess, by the end of Q3, which we never would have done in previous years. So it's all well and good. Um, we talk about it. We say we've done quite well. The market says we've, we've done OK. The industry won a couple of awards. But actually, for us at UB, um, it's really critical that we do well in the, with the retailers as well. Um, and we were delighted this year to move from where we were number 18 of 22 suppliers three years ago to number six last year. And actually this year we've moved to number one joint with PepsiCo, which we feel is a tremendous achievement bearing in mind our size and our resources. Um, you know, we are only a, we are a, we're not a massive, massive business, but we've managed to use our resources to best effect. And actually in terms of personal and, and um, and our resources itself, we came up very, very highly. But what's critical, I think, is more about the comments the retailers have said. So it's not just about where we are. Uh, it's more about the fact that actually for them too, the master brand strategy and the advertising gave them, gave them a, a real benefit. So sort of in conclusion, really, I think, you know, what I really wanted to get across was that you know, this was, I hope this is a good case study. It's not to say, gosh, you know, United Biscuits are brilliant at everything. We really aren't. We've got so many basics still to fix. Basic packaging things like getting our products facing the front, you know, or not facing upside down or whatever else they may be. You know, we're still not brilliant in terms of always knowing which activation to, you know, where to actually put our money along the path to purchase to really, really win. But I do think if you, if you can be really, really smart with some really simple things, if you just do them well, you can get there. And I think the critical, the critical things really is you want to be known, you want to be famous, you need people to, it has to be about the emotion. You know, it has to be about making sure that you're relevant in today's age. And, you know, we have to be effective. So to do all this, if we hadn't managed to get the sales uplift, the halo effect, or indeed the return on marketing investment, we wouldn't have done well. So, you know, thank you. Um, we are really, really, again, just to close as I started, really pleased that you've invited um, me to here today. I hope there were some interesting snippets in there that you can bring back to your own businesses. And um, looking forward now to seeing Jim's presentation on the trade.